Hey, how's it going? Well, I want to continue the studies on the deity of Christ, the fact that the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ was and is God. And, uh, in fact, he is God the Son. He's the second person in the Trinity. There are three persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But anyways, Jesus Christ, he was fully God and fully man, and there's plenty of evidence all over scripture and I've been going over that so I talked about you know statements that Jesus made that he claimed that he was God and I'm going to be going over more of those in this study I went and then I said that uh, you know the Jews confirmed that Jesus himself said that he was God and uh, I went over titles that were used in scripture where we can compare in the Old Testament where there are things said of Jehovah God the same things are said of Jesus and so either uh, the things that were said of Jesus were blasphemy or they're true, and Jesus is God, and of course they are true. And so I went over one of these. Uh, I'm going to talk about the I Am statements that Jesus made. And I went over one already because I talked about the, the state statements that Jesus made that proved that he was God. And uh, I, I probably went over it in multiple studies. It's a popular verse, you know, that gets used a lot where Jesus said, Before Abraham was, I am. And so I'm going to go over what I said about that again. And then, uh, you know, that's what we could consider an, an absolute I am statement where Jesus, you know, says I am. And we see it's, you know, it's used in the sense that of what was said of Jehovah in the Old Testament, I am that I am, when he said that to Moses. Um, anyways, but then there's these other I am statements where Jesus used that are, that are like metaphorical, where he said, I am the bread of life, I am the good shepherd, I am the true vine, I am the light of the world, I am the door of the sheep, I am the resurrection and the life, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so... Yes, there are seven of these, and some of these are used multiple times. Uh, there's two, two or three verses. The bread of life is used in three verses, and and there could be other uh, I am statements. Maybe that uh, you know could be possible. You know, seven sounds like a good number, anyways. You know, I'm talking about like Jesus says, "I am the Alpha and the Omega," but I already went over that as a title uh, of Christ proving that He is God as well, anyways. So. I want to go over these I am statements, and I spent way too much time looking at these, and I've searched through commentaries to try to find some of the best ones that will explain and expound these verses when Jesus said this to kind of show and explain better how these um, you know, statements and phrases used by Jesus actually point towards his deity. And uh, a lot of these are kind of saying the same thing in a way, in a... In a um, they're kind of, they kind of say the same thing in a different way. Um, and a lot of them, I think, point towards, you know, Old Testament things that are said of God and, or, or other things. And we see, like, Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of them, you know. For example, the bread of life, uh, I'll go over that. It's one of the first metaphorical I am statements that we use, you know. We know how God provided Israel with the manna. And, uh, that was just kind of a type of, Jesus, um, in a sense. So, anyways, I've probably spent too much time on these, and I actually don't even have a whole lot to say about them, I don't think. Hopefully this video will be short if I just get through this now. Usually I print out my studies and go over them, and uh, I'm out of ink right now. And I think that a good thing to do is, from now on, maybe anyways, would be to use this little tablet. And I'm just going to read right off the study that I have on my website on kjvforum.com. And uh, I'm just going to read right from this, and it's going to save ink and paper that way too. And so, um, anyways, I'll start with the first I am statement, just the one where he says, uh, before Abraham I was, or I am. Before Abraham was, I am. Anyways, we read about it in John chapter 8, verse 58 and 59. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. And so we see a lot of times these things that Jesus said to the scribes and the Pharisees, they turned around they wanted to stone him because they considered what he was saying blasphemy because they considered that what he was saying was he was saying that... Uh, I am God, you know, I, I, I and God are one, I and the Father are one. 
So, to expound on this, I am, the expression I am, though in the present tense, is clearly designed to refer to a past time. Thus, in Psalm 90, verse 2, from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Applied to God, it denotes continued existence without respect to time so far as he is concerned. We divide time into the past, the present, and the future. The expression applied to God denotes that he does not measure his existence in this manner, but that the word by which we express the present denotes his continued and unchanging existence. Hence, he assumes it as his name, I am, and I am that I am, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. Compare Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6, and Isaiah 47, 8. There is a remarkable similarity between the expression employed by Jesus in this place and that used in Exodus to denote the name of God. The manner in which Jesus used it would strikingly suggest the application of the same language to God. The question here was about his pre-existence. The objection to the Jews was that he was not 50 years old and could not therefore have seen Abraham. Jesus replied that, he existed before Abraham, as in his human nature he was not yet 50 years old, but could not, and could not, as a man, have existed before Abraham. This declaration must be referred to another nature, and the passage proves that while he was a man, he was also endowed with another nature existing before Abraham, into which he applied the term familiar to the Jews as expressive of the existence of God, I am. And this declaration corresponds to the affirmation of John in John chapter 1, verse 1, that he was in the beginning with God and was God, he is the I am, present equally in the human was and is and is to come. This affirmation of Jesus is one of the proofs on which John relies to prove that he was the Messiah, John chapter 20, verse 31, to establish which was the design of writing this book. Now, I want to mention these other verses, which I wasn't going to mention, but there are some other possible absolute I am statements. John chapter 6, verse 20, chapter 8, verse 24, and verse 28, and chapter er, and verse 58, and John chapter 18, verse 5. And so, I can look at some of those. Really, this one... Um, before Abraham was, I am. That's the one that you know people are going to use all the time, anyways. That's the more important one. These are seem, you know. Let me see. I want to maybe the first one I'm going to go to might not even be the best example, but John six twenty. Okay, but he saith unto them, It is I. Be not afraid. And so maybe the way that this is used from the Greek, maybe it better explains uh, how this relates to what is said of Jehovah in the Old Testament. I don't know. But uh, that, that's not as good of a verse to use to prove the deity of Christ um, you know, as before Abraham was, I am. But I'll look at John 8.24. John 8.24. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. And so here we have in the King James, whenever you see the italicized words, a lot of times they, it's where the, the King James writers filled in gaps to make things more understandable in English because, you know, in the Greek maybe it, it didn't make so much sense in English the way it was transferred. But a lot of times, you know, they're filling in these gaps, and it's like a figure of speech called an ellipsis that I want to go over more, where sometimes we use it a lot, but I can't think of a good example right now. I don't even want to try, really. But, you know, you say something, and uh, the person that you're speaking to, they understand what you're saying, but you don't use all the words to explain what you're saying. So there's, like, there's a gap. But, uh, and so here we have, they, th they thought it was an ellipsis, and they applied he. So, without the he there, it would say, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am, ye shall die in your sins. So then they would say, well, that's another instance where he's using I am. And maybe in the Greek, the way that he used that is the same as what is said in Jehovah in the Old Testament. I don't know. But regardless, uh, you know, to me, those verses aren't as strong of evidence. None of those that I mentioned are as strong as, strong as of evidence of the deity of Christ. Um, as the one where he says, before Abraham was, I am, John 8, 58. And uh, so that's the best absolute I am statement anyways, because we also see, you know, the preexistence. And so 
So there's, there's, you know, more than one way in that verse where we can see the deity of Christ. He pre-existed, and uh, which that could be debated, I guess. People could say that Christ pre-existed as an angel or something, which isn't true because of all the other verses in the Bible. But anyways, I'm just going on a tangent, I guess. But I would use John 8:58. So let's move on to these other I am statements. Um, so first we got I am the bread of life. John, it's used three times, John 6, 35, uh, and 48, and 51. So all in John chapter 6. And all these I am statements are used in John also. So John 6, 35, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. John chapter 6, 48 says, I am that bread of life. Very short and simple. John chapter 6, verse 51 says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. So, we see here, um, John chapter 6, verse 35, constant exercise of faith in Christ is the most important and difficult part of obedience required from us. And I think that I'm reading Matthew Henry's commentary, and I'm, you know, I'm not always going to name who I'm reading or whatever, but uh, yeah, a sister recently sent me a whole uh, collection of Matthew Henry Bible commentary throughout the whole Bible. It's pretty awesome. It's six books, and I do like his commentary on a lot of things, so I'm paying more attention to, to see what he says when I'm looking these things up. So anyways, it says, Constant exercise of faith in Christ is the most important and difficult part of the obedience required from us as sinners seeking salvation. When by His grace we are enabled to live a life of faith in the Son of God, holy tempers follow and acceptable services may be done. God, even, in, God, even His Father, who gave their fathers that food from heaven to support their natural lives, now gave them the true bread for the salvation of their souls. Coming to Jesus and believing on him signify the same. Christ shows that he is the true bread. He is to the soul what bread is to the body, nourishes and supports the spiritual life. He is the bread of God, bread which the Father gives, which he has made to be the food of our souls. Bread nourishes only the powers of a living body, but Christ is himself living bread and nourishes by his own power. The doctrine of Christ crucified is now as strengthening and comforting to, the belief, to a believer as it ever was. He is the bread which came down from heaven. It denotes the divinity of Christ's person and his authority, also the divine origin of all the good which flows to us through him. May we with understanding and earnestness say, Lord, evermore give us this bread. So, as we see here, you know, it, and these, one of these verses are actually, yeah, let's see. One of them, it says that he's a living bread which came down from heaven. And so I've used that before to explain uh, his pre-existence. And so, obviously, you know, these things can only be said of, Je of Jesus, you know, if he was divine. And so he is, you know, and on all these statements, he's pretty much saying, you know, I am God, I am God, but in, you know, different ways um, showing. So, yeah, and all of these I could go into way, way deeper. I've seen like R.C. Sproul, he has like a 60 page book or something online, like on these seven I am statements, basically. So there's much more that could be said, but I just kind of want to explain a little bit and see how they can show the deity of Christ. So, I am the light of the world. John chapter 8, verse 12, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. In John chapter 9, verse 5, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. He is the light of the world, because in him is the glory of God. His words are madness and something very like blasphemy, unless they are vindicated by the visible indwelling in him of the present God. He proclaims, I am the light of the world, plainly in the most absolute sense, for though he gives his disciples the same title, they are only light in the world, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, and though he calls the Baptist the burning and shining light, or lamp of his day, John chapter 5, verse 35, yet he was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light that was the true light, which 
coming into the world lighteth every man. John chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. Under this magnificent title, was, was, under this magnificent title Messiah was promised of old. Isaiah 42.6, Malachi 42. So I am the light of the world. In the most absolute sense, speaking of the glory of God that is in him. Okay. Uh, and so only Jesus Christ is the true light which lights which lighteth every man. So plainly he must be divine. So I am the door of the sheep. John chapter ten verse seven. Um then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. John chapter 10, verse 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. Those who come for salvation to God through Christ shall obtain it. He shall be saved. Which also means that he shall have his sins blotted out, and his soul purified, and himself preserved unto eternal life. This the scribes and Pharisees could neither promise nor impart, nor could any man. Um, besides Jesus, because he was fully God and fully man. So, uh, and you know, these are all exclusive statements. Jesus is saying, I am only me, okay, that, that Jesus is the only way. I am the good shepherd. John chapter 10 Verse 11, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. And let me see here. What was I going to look at? Was that one? Might want to go to that passage, actually. What was it John 10? Oh, let's see. Maybe that wasn't the one. I am the door of the sheep. Okay, anyways, I am the good shepherd. 10.11, I am the good shepherd, for the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. John chapter 10, verse 14, I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. Almighty God appears throughout the Old Testament as the true shepherd of Israel. The Lord is my shepherd, in Psalm chapter 23, verse 1. We are thy people, and the sheep of thy pasture, in Psalm chapter 79, verse 13. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a rock. Psalm 81. Psalm 80, verse 1. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Psalm 95, verse 7. Moreover, the whole 34th chapter of Ezekiel is given over to this metaphor of God as the good shepherd and the false leaders as the evil shepherds. This great chapter is the key to all that is spoken here. Now, in light of this very extensive metaphor in the Old Testament making God to be the only true shepherd of Israel, how is one to understand Jesus when twice he thundered the message that I am the good shepherd? It is no less a declaration that Jesus is God than if any other words had been employed to say it. That he did intend it thus is proved by the fact that when the Pharisees finally realized what he meant, they attempted to stone him for blasphemy in John chapter 10, verse 33. So, yeah, this is... Uh, Yeah, so he talks about how I am the good shepherd, and then later on we see the passage where he says, uh, you know, that no man can pluck the sheep out of my hand. And and no one can pluck them out of my father's hand. And then in John 10, verse 30, we see where he says, I am my father are one. Okay, and then they wanted to stone him. And the Jews said in verse 33, For thou being a man, makest thyself God. So before I talked about how Jesus said, I and my Father are one, and the Jews wanted to stone him. But the same thing goes for him saying that I am the good shepherd. Okay, so he's also saying, you know, that he and his Father are one by claiming that he is the good shepherd. Because we see Jehovah in the Old Testament is spoken of as the shepherd So, next is, I am the resurrection and the life. John chapter 11, verse 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, sh yet shall he live. 
And there's a lot here that I would really like to look into deeper about this whole passage. But I think it was Martha speaking to him, and, and she has spoken of the resurrection as a truth which she believes and as an event in the far-off future, so remote from the present life indeed as to be powerless to comfort her now. The two first words of his answer expressed in the fullness of emphasis teach her that the resurrection is thought of as his person and that he is to be thought of as actually present. I, his words mean, and none besides me am the resurrection. I am the resurrection, a present life, and not simply a life in the remoteness of the last day. In the same sense in which he declared himself to be the water of life and the bread of life, supplying in himself every need of spiritual thirst and spiritual hunger, he declares himself to be the resurrection, revealing in his own person all that men had ever thought and hoped of a future life, being himself the power which shall raise them at the last day, and could therefore raise them now. This is because he is also the life, and therefore everyone in communion. And so he's basically saying that the whole power to impart, maintain, and restore life resides in me. And we can see in John chapter 1, verse 4, and John chapter 5, verse 2, where one of them says that Jesus is the life, and uh, he also talks about having the power to raise the dead. What higher claim to supreme divinity than this grand saying can be conceived? So obviously the statement, I am the resurrection and the life by Jesus, he's claiming to be God. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now this is a very popular one. We hear this used a lot for... Um, you know, when people are given the gospel, talking about salvation, uh, you know, the exclusiveness of Christ. He's the only way to the Father. And, uh, you know, and I was thinking about how how bad it was, like Billy Graham, you know, on being interviewed by different people like Robert Schuller and uh, who else was it? Larry King and stuff. And Billy Graham, you know, he's been with the Pope and... He uh, makes he made these bad statements, you know, that basically, you know, anybody can be saved even if they don't believe in Christ. Basically, is kind of what he said. But then I'm thinking like how great it is when I've seen like John MacArthur on there, and he's a Calvinist, so I mark him off for that. But John MacArthur and even Franklin Graham, you know, Billy Graham's son, on Larry King and stuff, and they'll say this. They'll say, you know, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And so, at least they stand on that. So, it's a good thing when you hear that. But John 14, verse 6 says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. No other being possesses the characteristics which are possessed by our Lord Jesus, and which are necessary to constitute a sufficient mode of access to the Father. For what is Christ? He is God, and he is man. The way to God would be shut if it were not for the humanity of Christ, and the way to God would be imperfect if it were not for the divinity of Christ. Humanity is what gives to the work of the Savior adaptation. Divinity is what gives to the work of Christ efficacy, plenitude, and power. The sacred writings distinctly and solemnly declare that the work of Christ as a, the medium of access to the Father stands exclusive and alone. Neither is there salvation in any other, etc. Other foundation can no man lay, etc. This statement uh, by Jesus can be summed up as, I am the true way to eternal life. And so, I watched this video about some like metal magazine interviewer or something, and he was talking about, it was like a Christian magazine, and he was talking about interviewing Chris Cornell, this guy who I guess killed himself recently, I don't know what happened, but he was from like Soundgarden and Audio Slave, uh, some old popular grunge bands, he's pretty popular I guess, but anyways, you know, I don't know, he's probably in hell as far as I know, and it's not a funny thing, but anyways, this guy was talking about how he interviewed him, and you know, he asked him what he thought about Jesus, and he said that he thought Jesus was cool and smart and stuff, and uh, he uh, he confirmed that, you know, Jesus existed because uh, he said, you know, there's multiple accounts of 
many men of different type who, who wrote, you know, about the existence of Jesus. So he believed in him as a man, but then he asked him, what do you think about this statement by Jesus that he is the way, the truth, and the life? And he kind of like bounced around that one and said, you know, it depends on how you interpret it and this, and you know, how can it be explained or whatever. But, you know, it seems kind of obvious he, he didn't believe that Jesus was God. So, uh, you know, it's interesting, you know, bringing that verse to people and seeing what they think about it. And uh, and I still can't believe how people can call themselves Christians when they're anti-Trinitarian and they don't believe that Jesus is God. It just baffles me. Uh, but anyways, and you know that's a good thing. That's why I think that studying the deity of Christ is one of the most important doctrines, really. I mean, there's a lot of them. Of course, dealing with salvation and stuff as well. That it's by you know God's grace, not by works, etc. But you know just the doctrine of the deity of Christ, all the cults, a lot of cults, you know, reject that. There's some, you know, like Catholicism, you know, they, they believe that Jesus is God. There's maybe a few, but a lot of them reject the idea that Jesus is God. And, uh, you know, that's, it's a very important thing to recognize that it's necessary. Uh, you know, Jesus said, if you don't believe that I am He, you know, that He is the Son of God, and that He and the Father are one, Anyways, let's talk about how the last one, Jesus said, I am the true vine. John chapter 15, verse 1, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. The Old Testament, in the Old Testament, the vine is a type of Israel, planted by the Almighty as the husbandman to adorn, refresh, and quicken the earth. Psalm 80 and Isaiah 5, chapter 1, or verse 1. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 21, Ezekiel chapter 19, verse 10, Hosea chapter 10, verse 1. But Israel proved itself the degenerate plant of a strange vine. Jesus, therefore, is here the true vine, because he is the true Israel of God, in whom is fulfilled all that is demanded of the true vine, whether for beauty and blessing to, of the, to the world or for glory to the husbandman. In him all his people are summed up. He is not merely the stem, he is the vine, including in himself all of its parts. He is thus also the true um, vine, in contrast, not so much with degenerate Israel within Israel, as with Israel after the flesh as a whole, with the ancient, ancient theocracy even in its best and palmiest days. That theocracy had been no more than a shadow of the true. Now the true was come and God himself had planted it. And so, I also read that that's an interesting, that's a verse that kind of talks about the subordination of Christ to the Father, and how, you know, the Father is the husbandman, and he, you know, prunes the the branches, etc. And so, you know, we also see how, in that passage, John 15, 1, Where he says that, you know, if you abide in me, basically that, that you'll bear fruit, and if you don't abide in me, then you'll, you'll be withered, cast in the fire, basically. And so, you know, we see all the time that salvation is equated with bearing fruit. You know, if a person is saved, they will bear fruit. And um, if a person doesn't bear fruit, then they're not saved. Basically, so you know, this is kind of like a salvation verse uh, where he's talking about this. You know, again, that salvation is exclusive to him; he is the vine. And I do think that it does have reference to do with Israel as well, because of Israel being spoken of as the vineyard and stuff in the Old Testament. Um, so I do think that's in the sense that he calls himself the true vine. You know, a lot of the Jews thought because they were of the seed of Abraham that they were automatically going to be saved. And, you know, Jesus said, no, I am the true vine. Okay, you know, I am the good shepherd. You know, you must be one of my sheep. Okay. Um, and so, like I said, a lot of these things, I feel like they're kind of saying the same thing, but different aspects of Jesus, I guess. But they're all claiming his divinity and his exclusivity. 
um, that salvation is only through him. And they are kind of like fulfillments of, of types in a way as well. But anyways, I'm glad that I'm through with this. And I want to move on to what I think will be easier, maybe, uh, for the, the the deity of Christ. You know, I'm probably going to sum up a lot of things, maybe just maybe two or three more videos on this. And I'm going to talk more about a lot of the common stuff that people would go to, like Jesus was sinless, you know, creation was made through Jesus, and all that. And so I think that'll be a lot more simpler. You know, these you, these statements, you know, they seem so simple, but they're really packed with a lot of stuff too. So, so much more could be said, and hopefully in the future I'll get more into them. But it was kind of a struggle for me to, to find good commentaries that I really like that seem to really explain things and uh, hopefully you learned something but anyways I'll go ahead and pray and thank you God for this message and for this day and um, for life uh, and your son thank you for your son sending him and uh, for his dying for our sins and pray that doors will be open to evangelize all over the world Lord uh, that the kingdom on earth here will continue to press on and more souls will be saved, God. And we thank you in your mighty name. Amen. And so that's that. Hopefully this was short enough. It looks like it was around 30 minutes or so, 20, I don't know. Anyways, yeah, come to the website, uh, kjvforum.com, and you can go to uh, on the menu, Sound Doctrine. Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus, and look at the deity of Jesus, and this is on there at the top now. So it's one of the statements of Jesus that prove his deity. And uh, anyways, that's that. And thank you for watching, and God bless.